and to tell us about the, the center and help us to guide us through this discussion. So we'll have about one hour with the presenters and then we'll break out into uh, smaller groups for 30 minutes and have some conversation with the one presenter in each group or two. And then we will return for a full group conversation for 30 minutes to wrap up. Um, so Christian, take it away. Thank you, Blaine. Um, I'll just try to share my screen. Okay. Right. Well, well, thanks a lot for inviting us to, to, to kick off this, this conference on various Tuesdays about the, the main centers in the world which are working on uh, research in, in, in the field of character and virtue. Uh, so we'll organize our time in the following way. So I'll be speaking for about 20 minutes first. Uh, about the, the philosophy and methodology of the Jubilee Center and introducing sort of the work of the center. Uh, and then after that, I will give the floor over to Andrew Mail and Aidan Thompson. Andrew Mail is a research fellow uh, with a background in psychology and, and business. Uh, Aidan Thompson is uh, a member of the management team of the Jubilee Center. Uh, and they will be talking about one of our projects in the field of professional ethics. Uh, which is actually about the British police. And then finally, uh, I will give the floor to Gianfranco Polizzi, who will be talking about our work on, on uh, cyber issues, the cyber thrown issues of cyber wisdom with young people. So I decided basically to sort of give you snapshots, snapshots of the work that we are doing in the center. We are running four or five different projects at the moment, all in the field of current but I thought it would be most useful for you to A, get an overview of sort of our philosophy and then just to get snapshots of at least two of the projects that we are working on at the moment. So let me, let me kick off then uh, with uh, a few words about the philosophy of, of the Jubilee Center. So we occupy the, for those who have, for you who haven't been to Birmingham, we occupy the top floor in this building, the Muret Tower at the University of Birmingham campus. Uh, and like Blaine said, we have been working for nine years. We were founded in 2012. We are the largest research center in the world dedicated to moral character and virtues. Uh, and also like Blaine says, we employ about 15 people, uh, mainly doing research. Uh, and we conduct philosophical and social scientific research and developmental work with young people, work with schools, uh, primary, secondary or high schools and uh, colleges and also professionals. So we've done a lot of work with professionals like nurses, medical doctors, business people, teachers, etc. And at the current, we are working with the British police, as I said. Uh, we are a bipartisan center politically. Uh, we are not a religious center uh, and we are supported by a diverse group of people in the, in the UK, including the main political parties and, and the royal family. So we are a neo-Aristotelian center. So why did we decide at the outset to go for neo-Aristotelianism as our sort of grounding philosophy? Well, basically there were two other serious contenders, uh, contenders for a non-religious framework or a foundation for a center like ours. One was the positive psychological framework. Uh, now, obviously that has got various advantages. It's, fairly well conceptualized psychologically, especially after Bob McGrath sort of uh, put his authority on, on, on the work in, in positive psychology and factor analyzed all the findings from the VIA uh, tests. But it does have various disadvantages. Uh, it doesn't have any focus on phronesis, no sort of uh, metacognitive, meta-virtue, uh, to adjudicate virtue conflicts. Uh, a lot of the work there is based on an instrumentalist view of virtue as only valuable for uh, goals that go beyond being a good person, with the exception of Chris Peterson, who unfortunately died prematurely. Uh, and the normative uh, assumptions uh, in positive psychology are so sometimes a bit vague. Uh, they're sort of mainly focused on what is universally valued rather than what is universally valuable. Uh, 
And then there's a problem, obviously, uh, which was identified by in a recent presentation for this network and in the 2020 article in Perspectives on Psychological Science um, about the positive psychological aspirations to boost character strengths and virtues indiscriminately without taking account of the fact that those are sort of medial states uh, which can have both uh, extremes uh, of excess and deficiency. Now, the other option was Confucianism as also sort of a non-religious uh, philosophical foundation for virtue ethics. It does have certain pluses uh, which go beyond Aristotle, like it, it has an easier time than Aristotelianism in, in explaining people's attraction to high-minded ideals and personal purpose. I mean, it, it, it has an easier time to account for the flourishing of a person like Greta Thunberg, for example, than Aristotle would have. But again, I mean, there is no focus on phronesis. There is no sense of the, value, the, the importance of social conditions for leading a virtuous life. It's not naturalistic or scientific in the same way as Aristotelianism is, and, and obviously it imports a quite a few alien Chinese concepts, which would sound a bit odd to a, a Western audience. So we decided to go for neo Aristotelianism and on the grounds for various strengths. Uh, I will talk about those sort of in more detail when I go through the following slides, but just sort of a, a, a list here. Uh, it does have a naturalistic methodology. It's grounded in a blueprint of the good life, of flourishing. It does tell a fairly plausible developmental story about virtue acquisition, focuses a lot on critical thinking and reflection. It puts emphasis on virtue conflicts and, and metacognition, the, the role of, of the conductor of the whole orchestra, namely phronesis. It's quite sensitive to social context and variance. It's not only about fixing individual kids. Educationally, it combines insights from a number of different approaches to values education, character education, citizenship education, and social and emotional learning. Uh, and it's very practical and down to earth. So uh, the Aristotelian conceptual repertoire tends to resonate quite well with practitioners in the field, for example, teachers, parents, or professionals. So more about this later when I respond to some sort of potential criticisms. So let's just bring in a few objections. Uh, somebody might say, well, but this is just abstract philosophical theory, 2,300 years old. Where is the attention to empirical evidence? Well, actually, there's a lot of attention to empirical evidence, because Aristotle believed that all moral and educational theorizing needs to be answerable to empirical evidence. So he was just the naturalist par excellence. And this is, I think, precisely why Aristotle is so much liked by many social scientists today. I mean, Lane, Barry Schwartz, they are both here. Even Jonathan Haidt, although he sort of dramatically misunderstands a lot of what Aristotle is saying, he th still thinks that he, uh, he likes to endorse Aristotle. Uh, and Aristotle's theory needs to be constantly updated in light of new empirical evidence. This is exactly what he would have wanted to see. Uh, in various places in his corpus, he refers to the natural scientists and says we have to wait for the answer to this question until we get the evidence from the natural scientists. And a nice way to update Aristotle's theory can be found, for example, in, in Faust uh, and his colleagues' recent uh, piece in, in Pops. But actually, very few social scientists really grasp the radicality of the Aristotelian methodology. Uh, uh, it is an axiological, it's based on an axiological teleology. So it, it does more than just sort of encourage scientists to bring in more empirical research of the qualitative and quantitative kind. It, it sort of uh, advocates a, a fairly radical uh, new way of doing social science, uh, which maybe is closest to what we would see in preventative medicine. So there's a reason why Aristotle often uh, likens his work to that of a medical doctor. Now, but is there any developmental psychology in this? I mean, or if there is, isn't it all outdated? Well, the, the funny thing is that actually there is a fairly clear developmental story in Aristotle, which corresponds surprisingly well with current empirical research on moral identity, moral reasoning, and moral emotions as components of moral competence. 
So basically, there are sort of two plans in, in Aristotle for uh, moral development, one for the fortunate and well brought up, and another for the less fortunate and less well brought up. Unfortunately, though, there is no plan C for the, the people who are brought up in really terrible uh, circumstances, and I will say more about that later. So based on, on this developmental story, we have sort of constructed a, an updated version of the Aristotelian view of moral development. I, I won't go into it in any, any detail here, but uh, you can see the two plans. The, the upper line is the plan A for the people who are brought up in good habits and the people who, who eat all the broccoli because they love the taste of it. That's the people who sort of do the virtuous thing because they, they like it. And then the, the plan B, the lower line, is for those who sort of have to force themselves to eat the broccoli, uh, but they still eat it. Uh, and then they have a chance also to, to advance up to the, the upper level if, if they continue to develop the, uh, the, the moral competence. But like I said, I mean, there is unfortunately no plan C. There is no third line for, for those who have been sort of brought up in, in terrible conditions. The third common objection to an neo-Aristotelian framework is that it's anti-democratic and anti-intellectual and uncritical. I think some of this criticism is based on sort of the kind of character education that was prominent in the United States in the 1980s and 1990s, but what is forgotten there is that that kind of character education was not Aristotelian at all. Uh, according to Aristotle himself, virtuous behavior does not have any moral value unless it's been autonomously chosen by the individual and it has been chosen through an application of the intellectual virtue of phronesis. So criticality is built into the very definition of, of virtue in, in Aristotle. Uh, just being forced or conditioned to act correctly is not a display of, of good character. So morally virtuous action in Aristotle is very, very different from what behavioristically minded psychologists would, would refer to as pro-social action. The fourth common objection is that, uh, well, actually, virtue ethicists are always talking about how to avoid vice and how to bring up really virtuous people, but the, the big problem that most ordinary people face on a daily basis is not to make a big choice between being good and bad, it's to negotiate all kinds of conflicts in a pluralistic world, but different virtues and values can come into conflict with one another. But actually, this is one of the biggest advantages of Aristotelianism, that Aristotle spends so much time on talking about virtue conflicts and how to solve them, and, and he gives us this, this framework, this framework of phronesis, which is a fairly complicated framework, but, but still, I mean, not that difficult to explain to even people without a strong background in philosophy or psychology on on how different components of our sort of moral repertoire come together uh, in order to uh, bring about uh, a moral decision and uh, a moral action. Uh, but isn't this all individualistic? Is there any sense of social context there? Is, is this just not about fixing individual kids and, and making them better? Well, that's not true either because, I mean, Aristotelian character education aims at justice in a society, not just fixing individual students. And Aristotle writes a lot about civic virtues. So obviously, in order to develop an Aristotelian view of virtue, you, it's not enough just to read his Nicomachean ethics, you need to read his politics as well, because he thought of these two works as, as forming a, a kind of a, a sandwich that needed to be uh, eaten together. Uh, that said, I mean, the easiest place to start, especially with young kids, obviously, is with the individual student or, or the individual school or the individual family. Uh, and that's also how Aristotle wanted us to read his works. He wanted us to begin with the psychomoral message from the Nicomachean ethics, but he wanted us to proceed later on to the, the politics as well, especially when the kids grow up and become teenagers and young adults. And there's a lot of focus in Aristotle on the various external necessities needed to be in place for people to flourish. Uh, so in many ways, I mean, Aristotle's political philosophy is, is much closer to what people nowadays would, would call a socialist rather than, rather than an individualist or conservative. Uh, and he, he distinguishes, I mean, his, his uh, theory is 
can be distinguished very clearly from various other famous, historically famous theories of character and virtue, like those of Confucius or Stoicism or Buddhism or Socrates, in the sense that Aristotle poured scorn on the idea that somebody can lead a flourishing life just by being a morally good person. Uh, so Socrates believed that nothing can harm the, the morally good person. It doesn't matter what kind of trouble you get into or how horrible your life is, as long as you're morally good, then you are leading a flourishing life. And Aristotle, uh, who usually is very polite in his choice of words, he uses the word nonsense about these theories. He's, I mean, a person who is suffering, who's being tortured by an evil regime uh, on the wheel, as he says, uh, to say that, to point to this person and say that flourishing is just speaking nonsense. Uh, but is this, isn't this too philosophical? Is, is this not, is it really practical enough for teachers and ordinary people? Well, actually Aristotle says that the aim of our inquiry is not to know the good, but to become good. He was an extremely practical thinker. Uh, basically the complete opposite of, of Plato. Uh, and I have found that the, the more I talk about Aristotle to sort of ordinary people, parents, teachers, students, professionals, uh, the more I believe McIntyre when he says that plain people now, they think a lot like Aristotle. And if you spend a little bit of time explaining some of his core concepts to uh, ordinary people, concepts like eudaimonia or flourishing, phronesis, habituation, emulation, they tend to resonate extremely well. Uh, and uh, I've often been astounded when I speak to experiences of, of medical doctors or, or teachers or even parents about how well this conceptual repertoire seems to go down with the, with the audience. So if anything, neo-Aristotelian character education is too practical rather than, than too theoretical. But I don't want to sort of leave you with the impression that neo-Aristotelianism is all there is and, and that we basically the only thing we do in the Jubilee Center is just to, to read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics and Politics and sort of tidy them up in a few places. There are significant weaknesses in his uh, account uh, and those need to be remedied somehow. Uh, and there are various ways in which to do that. Some of them can be explained away through representations. Some just have to be ignored like bugs in the theory. Uh, some need to be uh, revised theoretically, others need to be updated empirically. And in some cases, what he says, although it sounds counterintuitive, we seem to have to bite the bullet at, and admit that maybe he was just right after all. So let me just give you four examples before I, I hand over to, uh, to my colleagues. So the, 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 what I see as sort of the four main issues that we need to deal with in Aristotle and will need to consider as weaknesses is his First of all, his early years determinism. Then there's a the paradox of moral education, his lack of sense of personal authentic purpose and a sense of awe or enchantment. And obviously his lack of attention to any, any measurement questions. Just a few words about each one of these weaknesses. So according to Aristotle, like I said earlier, uh, the person who is not really brought up decently as a, as a child he doesn't really think that person has much chance of, of succeeding in life or undergoing any kind of moral conversion to become a, a virtuous person. Uh, well, what should we do about this claim? One, one thing we could do is just to bite the bullet and accept it. Uh, that would make a very strong case for the importance of early years character education, even at the preschool levels. Another thing we could do is to fasten on a process in the, in the categories where Aristotle actually does mention the possibility of moral conversions later in life, or we simply modify or drop this, this claim in, in light of uh, contemporary anecdotal and empirical evidence. So there are various things you can do with this mistake and other mistakes in, in Aristotle, bite the bullet, reinterpret, ignore, etc. And we don't have a sort of a uniform policy on this. We sort of just look at this on a case-by-case uh, -case basis, but basically, the first thing we always do is to, is, to, is to check what does contemporary social science have to say about this. And this is something we can learn uh, from, from the, the contemporary academics that, that will can help to improve Aristotle's theory. The paradox of moral education is, is a term coined by Richard Peters. 
it has to do with the fact that Aristotle spends so much time talking about habituation and conditioning in the, in the early years of life, but then sort of spends very little time talking about how phonesis or critical thinking is developed. And it seems almost that there's, as if there's a paradox there that the best way to introduce somebody or cultivate somebody into a life of critical thinking is to do that through methods which are anything but critical. Uh, so he does talk about the role of friendship in bridging this gap between habituation and critical thinking, but all of that is, is quite truncated and, and incomplete. So we need a lot of new empirical research on phronesis and how to bridge this gap between habituation and, and critical thinking. Uh, so Aristotle is really strong on early years moral education, sort of the elementary school level. He's not as strong as sort of senior high school, early college years in education. There is no sense of personal authentic purpose uh, in Aristotle for the simple reason that that concept didn't exist in ancient uh, Greece. It is an enlightenment concept. The concepts of authenticity and personal purpose in, sort of originate in, in the enlightenment. Uh, and Aristotle talked a lot about purpose, but it was sort of the telos of the human species as a whole, not, not the, of, the, of the individual. And he, he had a specific antipathy to anything spiritual, uh, uh, which sort of was a kind of a, I think, an implication of, of his patricide he wanted to commit on, on, on Plato. He sort of hated Plato's spiritual exercises and uh, obsession with uh, sort of enchanted truths. He was a really down-to-earth kind of person. And sometimes uh, too much so for his own good. And finally, I mean, there's no attention to measurement questions in, in Aristotle, obviously. He was not a psychometrics guy. Uh, he probably would have agreed with Confucius that it is not a big issue. Like Confucius said, just see what a man does, examine in what things he rests. How can a man conceal his character? How can a man conceal his character? So, it was simple, simple answer to the question how, how you measure character. You just, you just look at the person. Uh, however, Aristotle is sensitive to various things which still occupy the mind of psychologists, like uh, self deceptions and the problems of self reports. Uh, but there is clearly a need to update Aristotle considerably in, in, in this respect. And, and uh, I particularly recommend a new book. Uh, on understanding what you buy right, Warren and Snow, as, as a, a nice, up, nice update on Aristotle regarding the measurement issue. Uh, so I've gone really quickly through the, the pros and cons of our neo-Aristotelian approach. Uh, I still believe that an updated form of Aristotelianism is, the, is our best bet in, in character research, at least from a, a practical perspective. Uh, as Aristotle would have said himself, the proof of putting lies in the eating and uh, I think now I'll give uh, the floor to two, uh, uh, to three of my three of my colleagues. First, two of them, uh, Andrew Mail and uh, Aidan Thompson, who will be talking about our work with the professions, with the police, uh, and that, that will give you a further indication of how sort of we uh, bring Aristotelian philosophy down to the ground and utilize it in our research projects. So thank you. Lovely. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where in the world you are. And thank you uh, so much for joining us today. Uh, it is my great privilege uh, to be speaking with you in my capacity as a research fellow at the Jubilee Center for Character and Virtues, uh, where I have the great fortune of working um, in the portfolio of, of work that explores virtues in the professions. And uh, the session I'm going to present now is going to be on the current project we're working on, which is Virtues in Policing. Uh, that is led by Professor Christian Christensen uh, with Aidan Thompson and myself. Um, and uh, for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to be focusing on a particular element of, of our research instrument, and namely the use of ethical dilemmas in our survey. But to begin with, I'm going to provide a brief background and introduction to the project. Uh, as well as an overview of our data collection methods. 
I'm then going to focus in on a particular ethical dilemma that we used in our survey. I'm going to explain its design, the response options, and then also look at how it was analysed. And then I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Aidan Thompson, who will present on how the previous professional work uh, has been integrated. So to set the scene uh, for the project and the role of professional virtue within policing, I'd like to highlight that, especially in academic contexts, there has been a significant virtue ethical turn in professional ethics, uh, with virtue ethics being the theory of choice. Um, and this can be seen, for example, in, in business, in nursing and in medical ethics. Um, although it is not necessarily seen in practice or happening on the ground, it is certainly something that we're very hopeful is, is on the horizon, um, especially in the context of policing in the UK, which um, is now seeing a merging between academia and, and professional practice. Um, indeed, some of our research indicates that there is anecdotal evidence um, of virtue ethics being included in courses, and these students will, in a year or two's time, uh, be fulfilling the role of police officers. And so we're, as I say, hopeful that in the near future we'll, we'll see more of this in, in practice. Um, but importantly, uh, the professional take on virtue ethics differs from that of moral and character education in that instead of being inspired by Aristotle's work, it stems from work by uh, McIntyre. And McIntyre's virtue ethical stance considers the concept of practice um, as something much wider than, than Aristotle's praxis. So for McIntyre, practice looks at the relevant goods and ends that are enabled through technical skills, uh, which are enriched by, by the human goods. Whereas for Aristotle, praxis concerns the sphere of phrenesis. Uh, some of the virtues that are encompassed in uh, McIntyre's concept of, of practice are not considered virtues at all by Aristotle, but rather techne or technical skills. And this would include professional skills such as written and verbal communication uh, and conflict management. The Virtues in Policing Project has sought to find out what role character virtues play in both the day-to-day -day role of police officers, but also to see how it's included in the education and training of future police officers with students that are enrolled in either the professional degree program or one of the um, two apprenticeship programs. And we have utilized a mixed method research design that uses a combination of quantitative and qualitative research uh, in the form of a survey um, and also with semi-structured interviews, respectively. The survey was sent out to police officers and students um, through their forces, through their universities, and also through various um, networks and, and committees that were willing um, and eager to, to support our research. And we were thrilled that we had uh, over 570 um, full completions of the survey. Uh, the majority of these were, were completed by police officers, but we also had um, uh, su substantial numbers of, of first year students. Um, and then the second cohort that we looked at were second year students through to master's students which also included the, the two types of apprenticeship programs. And importantly, um, this has all been taking place against a backdrop of huge change in, in the policing world in, in England and Wales. Most notably, uh, policing is, as of 2020, a graduate profession, and therefore all new police officers will be required to have degrees. And of course, it's also worth mentioning that it has um, been taking place against a plethora of, of headline news items um, in the UK related to policing with issues such as Black Lives Matter, um, COVID, Kill the Bill, and the, the, Sarah, um, the Sarah Everard vigil. Um, and there are two phases to this research. I'm speaking specifically to the first phase, um, and Aidan will um, discuss the second phase in his section of the presentation. So the survey, well, the survey was uh, developed from previous work on, on professional virtue that was undertaken by the center, um, but it also took into consideration the novel educational requirements and the unique nature of the profession. The survey included six ethical dilemmas, the design of which um, I'm going to discuss in more detail shortly. It also respondents to identify and rank their top six character strengths from the 24 um, character strengths listed 
in the Virtues in Action Inventory of Strengths, the BIA. Um, and they were asked yeah. to select the top six that they felt best described themselves. And they were also asked to rank the top six that they felt best represented the ideal police officer. Participants were then also asked about their views on their workplace or student environment, um, both pertaining to ethical issues and also more, more general working conditions. And then there were questions related to biographical information. The survey went through a process of internal review and testing within the center. And that is before it went um, and was subjected to scrutiny by the uh, ethical review committee at the University of Birmingham for which it was granted full ethical approval. Now, focusing more specifically on the six ethical dilemmas and how they were designed. Well, they were designed collaboratively um, with the expertise and experiences drawn from our expert panel on the project to bring together vast um, and varied experiences, both as having had a variety of roles within police forces in, in England, um, but also um, because they are involved in academic research and teaching of, of the professional policing degree in, in England. Uh, these dilemmas uh, represent realistic scenarios of, of ethical dilemmas that police could face. And they were drawn from a combination of real life experiences and um, some were, were loosely based on, on notable cases um, that would be familiar with the police. Each of the dilemmas presented a narrative to explain the scenario and to set the scene. And following this, respondents were asked, um, respondents were, were presented with two alternative options of responding to the situation. And they were asked to select the, the course of action that most likely uh, resonated with them. Importantly, the two available courses of action were both amenable to um, moral justification neither option presented an immoral course of action. Uh, it certainly was not our aim, is not our aim, to test participants' general allegiance to a moral outlook, but rather we're interested in evaluating their moral reasoning strategies. Once they've made the choice, they're then presented with a list of six possible justifications or response options um, for taking that course of action and responding in that way. And from these six options, respondents are asked to select the top three, um, that most closely align with their reason for responding in this way. Of the six uh, reasons or justifications that are provided, two of them represent uh, deont deontological responses, two of them represent virtue ethical responses, and two of them represent consequentialist responses, uh, one of which is self-serving and, and, and one of which of the consequentialist options is, is utilitarian. And um, and I will discuss these in, in, in more detail um, when I focus on a specific ethical dilemma. But the ethical dilemmas overall um, included, so the six in, included a murder investigation uh, where, you, where the, the respondent is asked to consider between violating a legal requirement in order to solve the murder and, and bring about justice. There's a potential suicide case where your intuition tells you to stay with the vulnerable in, individual but you're instructed to do otherwise. Witnessing racism at work, which is the dilemma I'll, I'll focus on next. Uh, conflict um, between work and personal life, um, in this case being called back to duty um, on the day that just so happens to be your child's birthday party. Um, whether or not to conduct a stop and search due to complaints that have been received from a neighbor relating to antisocial behavior and, and drug use and then also um, responding to and finding a solution to a potential, a potential domestic violence case. All right, so now to go into more detail with the ethical dilemma about witnessing racism at work. Um, I'm going to talk about, talk through the narrative of, of the scenario. I'll discuss the two alternative options for responding, and then I'll look more closely at the six justifications for each option and subsequently how they were analyzed. So the scenario states, you work in a police response unit. A new female student officer of South Asian heritage joins your team under the degree holders entry program. Whilst you are alone with a close and experienced white male colleague, he refers to the new officer and comments. I bet her parents are disappointed she's a copper. 
a packy with a degree, there's not many of them. She should have done law and become a lawyer with finance and been an accountant. You have never previously heard your colleague express views like this and have worked alongside him for a number of years. What would you do? Respondents are then uh, prompted to select one of two uh, available response options. They could either have a private work with their colleague and um, challenging their behavior and explaining that it's both offensive and unacceptable, or they could speak to their supervisor and make a formal, uh, re re formally report um, and a complaint against their colleague's conduct. For those who select the first response option, they are presented with six possible justifications and they are asked to consider from this list of six which their top three reasons would be and to rank these as first, second and third. So these options include, your colleague might take more notice with you speaking to him privately and it's more considerate and empathetic than reporting the matter to the sergeant. You believe in the moral rule that you should treat others like you would want them to treat you. You believe that what was said is out of character and that it's in everyone's best interest to uh, address the issue without damaging your colleague's career. You choose to deal with the matter without reporting it to a supervisor because you fear that you might be isolated for whistleblowing against a colleague. You decide that the right thing to do would be to find out why your colleague spoke in such a way because you have a collegial duty towards him. Or your own personal values dictate that you directly and immediately try to help your colleague improve his behavior regardless of what is included in the code of ethics. For those who um, select the second response option, they're also provided with, with six um, reasons and asked to rank these as first, second, and third. So for those who would prefer to um, formally report their, their, their colleague's conduct to their sergeant, um, they could choose that bringing the matter to the attention of the supervisor is the right thing to do. That the conduct can be addressed by management. You empathize with the new female officer. You wouldn't want to be spoken about like that by a colleague. Um, the code of ethics states that police officers must challenge and report improper behavior because they have a duty to treat everyone with dignity and respect, fairness and impartiality, and not to discriminate unlawfully or unfairly. It's your duty to report such matters. You think it is important for police officers to be able to trust each other and work closely together, particularly in dangerous and difficult circumstances. Your colleagues' conduct erodes trust and you consider that to be an important virtue. You want to prevent potentially harmful consequences to local communities where race relations between different groups can often be tense. If your colleague can speak about another officer in this way, then how might they treat members of the public? As someone who is prepared to report issues of misconduct, it will benefit your career. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the six justifications um, that we provide for each of the two options are broken down into two virtue ethical reasons, two deontological reasons, and two consequentialist reasons. And of the two consequentialist reasons, one is utilitarian and one is self-serving. And this can be seen um, in the table on this slide, which breaks down the response options that were presented when respondents selected that they would choose to have a private word with their colleague. And we analyze the response, the responses for their content. So we score them, um, we give them scores for those that are, are selected as first, second, and third choices. Uh, and we group these according to the, the different categories. We then add the total scores for all the reasons, we sum them into a grand total, and we calculate the proportion that each reason represents, which is presented as a percentage of preference. And lastly, we add the virtue ethical responses together, we add the deontological responses together, and we add the consequentialist responses together. And it allows us to evaluate the moral reasoning strategies that are selected. We can see which ones tend to dominate. And of course, there are some dilemmas that might evoke uh, more different moral reasoning strategies. Um, for example, from previous research, uh, the ones that involve work and personal life dilemmas um, have traditionally prompted um, more virtue ethical responses. And we'll be interested to see if this is the same for the police. And then we review these trends in responses overall, and we also look at them um, more specifically for each dilemma. Um, I now hand over to my colleague, Aidan, who will continue the presentation. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so as both Christian and Andrew have 
uh, already alluded to, this police project forms part of a wider uh, consideration of virtues within the professions overall. To date, excluding the police, um, we've looked at six professions, five of which have adopted identical methodologies to the one that Andrew has pointed out with the police, and then one with the British Army, which was um, slightly different. Um, in our previous grant phase, uh, it was suggested to us, and it was something we probably would have done anyway, but maybe we've done it a little bit sooner. But it was suggested to us to rather than continue to create mosaic pieces by collecting data on individual professions that we actually look to paint a picture with them and integrate them overall, which is what we've done with the, the two reports on this slide. Um, looking at five of the professions that had adopted the identical methodologies, looking at doctors, teachers, lawyers, business and finance professionals, and nurses, 3,502 professionals and trainee professionals overall. Um, go to the next slide, please, Andrew. Initially, so the two um, areas of the, the two main different methodologies that we've adopted are looking at the prioritization of um, virtues, character strengths using the VIA, um, and then responses to the dilemmas. So looking at the responses to the VIA and the ranking of virtues, we've been able to create character profiles of all of the um, participants across um, all three cohorts. With the VIA, um, there isn't an explicit uh, civic virtue focus, so we've looked pr predominantly across the moral and the intellectual virtues. And where there have been performance virtues, where there are performance virtues as part of the VIA, we've included those within the moral focus, um, partly because of our approach that into, uh, the performance virtues are only virtues where they do have uh, a moral tether or a moral application which might lead uh, to some criticism of bias from our side in terms of the analysis, but also that um, ha had weight added to it through the interviews that we conducted with participants across all career stages that were also seeing the performance virtues in moral ways. So those four profiles that we've been able to, to create are on screen there, alternative character profile, intellectual character, moral character, and what we've called frenetic character profiles. The percentage split across the cohort um, are also identified there. So we can see that actually the moral character profile um, is the largest group across all five professions that we've looked at. And those um, include those uh, participants that are valuing moral virtues and therefore moral and intellectual, moral and performance virtues ahead of the intellectual virtues. And actually it's the frenetic character that forms the smallest cohort, only 15% of participants, those that value both the moral and performance and the intellectual virtues. Um, these are written up in the, in the two reports that are linked to on the screen and available via the Jubilee Centre website. Uh, next slide, please, Andrew. Then we've looked at uh, the dilemma analysis and we've written this up, um, myself and colleagues, in an article in the Journal of Business Ethics, which was published in 2018. It is open access. Uh, it's called The Value of Character-Based Judgment in the Professional Domain if you do wish to look it up. This only looked at um, what we called entry level professionals, so that were just concluding their um, pre-service study or just entering the profession, um, and those that had uh, a certain number of years experience in service. Two of the main findings from looking at the um, character strengths, but also the dilemma responses, were that professionals who valued the character also reported higher notions of professional purpose than those who only valued professional judgment. Therefore, there is, a, there is something there around character and purpose, um, which maybe talks a little bit to something that Christian said as a weakness of Aristotelian character education, that purpose uh, was not a language that was used in ancient Greece and only came, um, came later on. I, I haven't got time here to talk about all of the methodology behind looking at purpose but we do have um, we did have some method uh, and some tools used to consider that the second key finding was that um, the risk is in training and in professional training that actually not prioritizing character may allow professionals to disconnect from any wider sense of purpose and that has come up through interviews with professionals themselves but also with educators that it is uh, important to prioritise character in the pre-service training and the in-service continuing training of professionals. Next slide, please. 
So as Andrew has spoken to, the first phase of our current project, looking at the police um, in the UK, um, will come to a conclusion this summer when we write up the first stage um, of our data collection and analysis. We will then move on to stage two, which is looking at continuing to cultivate phronesis um, within professionals more broadly, but also particularly with the police in this instance. It aims to build on existing Jubilee Centre work. There was a project that we did a few years ago, which looked at pre-service training um, across doctors, lawyers and teachers, and the how phronesis and character and virtues can be cultivated within that. What we did was produce an online course, which educators, um, university educators used with their students at undergraduate level. Um, to some, some degrees of success, it was, it was somewhat limited. Um, it was definitely exploratory um, in, its, in its scope, but there are opportunities now to advance that and bring it into the professional domain and look at the professional, continuing professional development of, of, um, across professions. We intend to work with in-service professionals um, not just with the UK police, but also with other professions, and it, uh, to have some sort of place within continuing professional development, which um, is a main focus of a number of different professions, particularly in UK policing, but also in law, in medicine, in nursing, etc. That will begin in uh, the autumn, probably around September this year, and then go on for about 12 months as we look to build an intervention and then test it with uh, across professions. Next slide, please, Andrew. That was all of them. Um, thank you very much. And I'll hand over now to my colleague, Franco Polizzi. Hi, everyone. So, yes. So what I'm going to do today is just to talk about um, basically the Cyber Wisdom Project that I'm working on as part of a kind of work um, at the Jubilee Center. Um, and in terms of outline, I'll, I'll start by kind of talking about the context and kind of um, kind of an overview of the project. Then I will just uh, briefly talk about some key findings that we um, that we got from two, from two surveys that we recently conducted. I'll then focus uh, on basically our conceptualization of cyber wisdom as a multi-component construct, and um, and I'll off, uh, will also offer some kind of preliminary thoughts in terms of how we are thinking uh, about kind of measuring cyber wisdom as a construct. And then I'll conclude with a, with a timeline um, related to the, in relation to the project. So um, at the Jubilee Center, we're working on, on this project called um, Cultivating Cyber Wisdom, which we also refer to as cyber phrenesis, since we draw on um, Aristotelian virtue ethics and the concept of phrenesis, uh, which is indeed translated often as practical wisdom. This project is based on the development, um, implementation and evaluation of a cyber wisdom project program in secondary schools in England. Our research aims to evaluate the extent to which the program is effective in promoting different aspects of wisdom among 13, 16 year olds in relation to how they use the internet. The project builds on previous work um, on phrenesis that has been conducted at the center. And the goal is to provide adolescents with the ability to exercise wisdom when using the internet in ways that can enable them to navigate both online opportunities, think for example about you know, opportunities for learning, socialization, but also online risks, for example, in terms of privacy, misinformation, forms of online abuse, such as cyberbullying. Importantly, in our work, we frame cyber wisdom education as a form of moral and character education that overlaps with digital citizenship education, which is concerned with the teaching of how to use digital technologies responsibly. We argue um, that both in terms of research and in relation to practice, more efforts are needed to adopt a virtue ethical lens in the context of understanding, researching and promoting digital citizenship education. Indeed, both in the UK and elsewhere, schools often teach elements of moral education through digital citizenship education, which is generally promoted through different subjects of the school curriculum. However, this comes with challenges. First of all, there is no unified or coherent framework uh, on how to teach digital citizenship, which is not firmly embedded in the, in the curriculum. In practice, schools often teach some elements of moral education, but they do so primarily um, in line with the ontological and utilitarian principles. Um, and by contrast, little emphasis is placed on the importance of possessing and deploying not just character virtues, such as compassion, honesty, and respect, but ultimately wisdom as a meta virtue that can help students uh, decide which virtues to draw and act upon online, depending on context. Uh, finally, this issue is made even more problematic by the fact that the ontological and utilitarian approaches 
uh, to moral education based obviously on kind of encouraging students to you know um, follow rules or to kind of um, think about the consequences of their online actions are effective only to some extent and they're not enough on the one hand rules can be rather abstract and oblivious to the emotional kind of dimensions uh, um, of, of users when it comes to their engagement with the internet um, and on and on the and on the other hand it is also challenging to expect children to reflect on the long-term repercussions of their temporarily distant online actions. So this is why in our work we approach the concept of moral decision making uh, online, the decisions that users need to make to navigate the ethical implications of online opportunities and risks, primarily from the perspective of virtue ethics and in ways that intersect with the ontology and ut utilitarianism. Relatedly, this is why we argue that digital citizenship education needs to overlap in practice with cyber wisdom education. But what does cyber wisdom mean in the first place and how can it be conceptualized? Before attending to this question, I'd like to report first a couple of key findings that will set the scene for the importance of promoting wisdom in the digital age, or as we call it, cyber wisdom. We recently conducted two surveys, one with adolescents aged 13, 16 in England, and one with parents of children aged 13, 17 across the UK. And these surveys were conducted to explore what adolescents and parents think of and to what extent they act on character virtues and wisdom online. Interestingly, what we found is that both adolescents and parents prioritize the importance of showing wisdom when using the internet. More specifically, most adolescents, 38%, um, chose making good and wise decisions as one of their top two qualities in relation to what they want their friends to show when using social media. Meanwhile, most parents as well, 56%, also reported as one of their top two qualities that they want their children to make wise decisions when they use the internet. So I should clarify that for the purposes of both surveys, wisdom was operationalized in line with the framework of the Jubilee Center as an intellectual virtue. As, I men as mentioned earlier though, wisdom is not just an intellectual virtue, it's, it's, just, it's more than that. It also functions as a meta virtue that orchestrates how we should deploy different virtues within different contexts. So what do we mean by, by cyber wisdom? Cyber wisdom, broadly speaking, refers to the ability to do the right thing at the right time when online. In order to conceptualize what it involves as a construct, in our theoretical work, which is underway, we're drawing not just on Aristotelian, Aristotelian virtue ethics, but also on moral psychology. And we're doing this by drawing on three different models of wisdom that are prominent in the literature. The reason for doing this is to better position the concept of cyber wisdom while also building on previous models. The models that we're taking inspiration from include two models that are grounded in moral psychology, which are Ardell's 2004 model of wisdom, as well as Grossman and colleagues' recent common model of wisdom. In addition, we're drawing on Darnell and Christian's recent model of phrenesis, which is a concept that, as I said earlier, is grounded primarily in Aristotelian virtue ethics. Our decision to propose a distinct conceptualization of cyber wisdom is embedded in the recognition that the digital age presents challenges that are intrinsic to using the internet. On the one hand, the internet presents considerable opportunities, but also a number of risks. Uh, in addition, what is distinct about the digital age is that these risks are often exacerbated by the affordances of digital technologies. That is the, you know, the technical features of digital technologies um, and the ways in which they are designed. The internet makes it easier, for example, to connect with users who are geographically distant, but the absence of visual cues and body language has also been found to reduce empathy, which means that perpetrators of online abuse are less likely to change their behavior online um, since they might not necessarily realize how their victims feel. Also, the internet affords users the ability to disguise their identity, so we're talking about anonymity, and, and to interact with others um, anonymously, which again can kind of contribute to online abuse. So at the same time, the internet is not just designed in ways that amplify online risks, but also, I mean, so does its, its political economy. That is the ways in which, you know, platforms are uh, kind of are managed uh, and internet corporations run search engines and their services. And um, the internet is, you know, subject to limited regulation. Uh, and which also means that what happens online is subjected to reduced monitoring and supervision. Furthermore, the internet um, for, for the more internet corporations, as I was also saying, use kind of algorithms in the name of personalizing content that have implications in terms of data tracking, but also in terms of kind of, you know, spreading both information and misinformation, as well as kind of creating filter bubbles, which um, have, you know, been found to kind of, uh, um, which have been associated with an increase in polarization. So it follows that possessing wisdom in the digital age means that users need to be able, able to navigate the ethical implications of online risks and opportunities. 
in ways that are specific to the digital age and apply to context that may well be different online than offline. So with this in mind, on the one hand, our conceptualization of wisdom includes different components that build on different aspects that relate to those three models of wisdom that I mentioned earlier. More specifically, the four components of wisdom are cyber wisdom literacy, cyber wisdom reasoning, cyber wisdom self-reflection, and cyber wisdom motivation. On the other hand, while those models are not concerned necessarily with digital technologies, each component of cyber wisdom applies specifically to the digital age. So let's talk about these components in, in, in greater depth. So the first is a cyber wisdom literacy. We define this component as an understanding of the nature of different virtues, such as compassion and honesty, as well as the context in, and ways in which different virtues apply to the digital age. As such, this component relies on cognition, the mental processes that are involved in gaining knowledge and comprehension. And in these terms, it builds on Ardell's component of cognition, uh, and it also resonates with Grossman and, um, and others kind of component of uh, PMC perspective or metacognition, particularly in relation to the role that cognition plays as the foundation of metacognition. Finally, it also echoes Darnell and Christian's constitutive function of phrenesis, which requires the use of cognition, indeed, for understanding what virtues apply to different events. However, cyber wisdom literacy is, con is specifically concerned with the digital age. This means in practice understanding how multiple virtues can be acted upon in ways that preserve a balance between taking advantage of online opportunities while avoiding or coping with online risks. So having wisdom, uh, cyber wisdom literacy includes, for example, appreciating the importance of using social media to access information and, inter and interact with others, while also understanding the value of producing and disseminating information online in line with principles of honesty or in ways that are underpinned by compassion towards those who receive, for instance, negative comments on social media. The second component of cyber wisdom is cyber wisdom reasoning. This component, which is also grounded in cognition, refers to the ability to choose the right course of action online, especially when confronted with moral dilemmas based on the clash of two or multiple virtues. As such, this component builds on Grossman's component of PMC, particularly in relation to its importance for navigating moral dilemmas, as well as on Darnell and Christian's integrated, integrated function of phrenesis, which is also concerned with kind of evaluating events, uh, particularly when these present, uh, again, moral dilemmas. However, unlike their models, the wisdom reasoning is grounded in the recognition that moral dilemmas online can be exacerbated by the technical features and the political economy of the internet. Examples of such dilemmas, therefore, may include accessing information free of charge, for example, versus observing copyright laws, which may be constraining for users with limited financial resources, but also whether or, or not to show respect or even compassion for users who show abusive traits on, on platforms like Facebook, or whether or not to use social media in the first place to show compassion to others, as opposed to engaging um, in face-to-face -face interaction. What is specific about this component is that users need to factor in whether and if so how experiencing moral dilemmas online may involve scenarios that are specific to using the internet. This means that users can only exercise the wisdom reasoning as long as they account for the ways in which dealing with moral dilemmas may be different online as opposed to offline. The third component is of cyber wisdom is self-reflection. This, this is the most distinct component of cyber wisdom since unlike the other models, it lies more explicitly at the intersection of metacognition the mental processes that we use to evaluate our own cognitive processes and affect. This component consists of the ability to navigate our own perspectives and those of others, as well as our own emotions and those of others. These, are, these two aspects are particularly important when it comes to using the internet, since both its affordances and political economy, as discussed earlier, amplify online risks that, are, that reflect different positions and are fueled by emotions that enforce for example, hatred and division among different, you know, to, towards kind of among different users and, and community, communities, sorry. Conceived as such, this component builds partly on our dealt component of reflection, understood as the self-examination of events from multiple perspectives, but it also applies to Grossman's component of PMC. Meanwhile, it also builds on Darnell and Christian's component of emotional regulation, which refers to the ability to regulate one's own emotions. Concerned with the digital age, this component component prescribes that users need to be able, first of all, to reflect on their own biases and to regulate their own um, emotions when dealing with moral dilemmas online. For example, when managing feelings of empathy or anger in the context of interacting with others who show abusive traits. At the same time, it also means that users need to be able to navigate the emotions of others within online settings in which their own biases might clash with the perspectives of others. So, for example, within context of public debate online, affected by polarization, fueled by sentiments of hatred. 
Finally, the fourth and last component of cyber wisdom is cyber wisdom uh, motivation. This component, which has to do with moral identity, uh, refers to a desire to act online, um, or to act on different virtues online, in line with principles of the common good. This is why it builds on Grossman's component of moral aspirations, particularly when, I'm, when understood as an, uh, as an orientation towards the common good. Furthermore, it resonates with Darnell and Christian's blueprint component of phrenesis, which consists of the motivation necessary to adjust one's own identity in line with the deals of the common good. In practice, possessing savvy wisdom motivation means to construct and mobilize expectations of how oneself and other users should deploy different virtues when using digital technologies and interacting with one another within online contexts. This means that users moral aspirations could include, for example, expecting users to interact online in ways, um, in honest and compassionate ways, expecting online communities to engage in public debate in ways that are mindful of their own different concerns, but also in ways that are underpinned by a certain degree of civility, which is crucial to, to the functioning of democracy. Finally, this might also include expecting internet corporations and social media platforms to make more efforts to tackle online risks in line with virtuous principles of transparency and accountability. So now that I've discussed how we conceptualize cyber wisdom in our work, I would like to offer some preliminary, very briefly, some preliminary thoughts as to how we're thinking to measure its different components, these different components, as part of the kind of evaluation research that we will be conducting from September onwards with a view to testing the effectiveness of the cyber wisdom intervention for secondary schools that we're currently developing. This work is underway, so what I'm going to offer, as I said, is provisional. The school intervention will be tested through an experimental design based on the administration of pre and post surveys. And in order to measure savvy wisdom literacy, um, we are thinking to use an adapt survey item from Toma and others, adolescent intermediate concept measure, particularly in the context of asking students um, taking the surveys to identify and select the relevance of different virtues that clash in a story of an online dilemma. This, uh, this measure, as with the rest of the measures, that I'm about to introduce will need uh, to be adapted specifically with a view to apply more closely to example stories and scenarios that have to do with using digital technologies. Similarly, the me uh, to measure cyber wisdom reasoning, we're thinking to use and adapt uh, survey items from Brianza uh, and others situated by reasoning scale, specifically in terms of measuring participants' level of recognition in the context of a story or an online dilemma of multiple perspectives of intellectual humility that is of the limits of one's own knowledge and of the need for compromise for purposes of conflict resolution. In addition, we're thinking to use a few more items from Toma, um, so adolescent intermediate concept measure, particularly to measure participants' level of, of agreement on different possible courses of action in response to the online dilemma. Meanwhile, when it comes to savvy wisdom self-reflection, we're thinking to measure participants' degree of prejudice towards other internet users, as well as their own bias awareness, by using and adapting different instruments, such as those developed by Goffrey and others, uh, or uh, by Perry and colleagues. Furthermore, we're thinking, um, we think, we're planning to adapt items from Deb uh, Davis' Interpersonal Reactivity Index, which we will use to measure participants' level of empathetic recognition of multiple perspectives within online context. Finally, in order to measure cyber wisdom motivation, we're thinking to use and adapt items from Patrick and Gid's moral self-relevance instrument, especially in terms of measuring the level of importance that participants at, at, um, attribute to both moral and non-moral qualities online in relation to their sense of self. In addition, we're planning to adapt items from Crocker and, and colleagues, contingencies and self-worth measure, which we would use to measure students' level of importance of virtuous living online to their own self-esteem. Finally, we're also thinking to adapt items from Cheeks and uh, Cheek and others aspect of identity measure, particularly with a view to measuring participants' level of importance of different virtues and moral standards to their own self. So it is with all of this in mind that I would like to conclude with a, with a few words um, on the timeline of our project and our next steps. As I mentioned earlier, we recently conducted two surveys. Uh, one with adolescents and one with parents. These surveys were conducted to explore what adolescents and parents think of and to what extent they act on character virtues and wisdom online. We've just published a report with key findings from both surveys, and we've also been working on the development of the cyber wisdom education intervention. We, more specifically, we've been designing the lesson plans and resources that will be used as part of the intervention, and we've asked a few teachers to review this and to help us develop our materials. What we'll do next is to ask these teachers to pilot with their own students some of the lesson plans and resources that we're developing. In the meantime, we're going to design, adapt, and pilot 
both through a small survey as well as cognitive interviews, the instruments that we will use to evaluate the, effect and the effectiveness of the intervention. These include not just the measures that, as discussed earlier, we will use in the pre and post surveys with students, but also two topic guides, which we will use for semi-structured interviews with teachers and for focus, group with focus groups with students. The cyber wisdom intervention will then be rolled out and data will be collected from September onwards. Finally, from March 2021, we will work on data analysis and on the reporting and dissemination of our key findings. Thank you very much, and we look forward to, to your questions and to having a discussion all together. Thank you very much for those wonderful talks. Uh, gave us a very good overview of the Jubilee Center in general, and then of two specific and very timely projects about uh, uh, cyber wisdom and policing uh, that are very much on our minds these days. Um, I've set up some uh, breakout rooms now. So what we're going to do is divide into three groups and um, Andrew and Aid lead one group on policing. Uh, Christian will lead another group on the Jubilee Center more in general. And um, uh, Franco will lead a group on cyber wisdom. Uh, and it's set up so that if you're just dying to be in a different group than you end up being assigned to, you can switch. Uh, so feel free to move about if you uh, prefer that. Uh, but I'm going to set it up now and we'll go for the first 25 minutes in the small groups and then we'll come back uh, after those small groups end and have uh, further discussion as a whole group, uh, beginning with a very brief summary from each subgroup. Um, so I'm going to send you all to rooms now. Oh, Jay, did I not send you to a room?
how can we help young, young, how can we help kind of young people? Can Welcome back. I hope the uh, transition wasn't too abrupt. It gives you a 60 second warning that you may or may not have seen. Uh, but I did pop into the breakout rooms to get just a little flavor of what was happening there. And it's very interesting. Um, kind of wished I could have been in all three at the same time, but uh, not possible. Um, so uh, we have a relatively small group uh, with us still going. So I would say, let's just jump right into uh, the group discussion. Sometimes we have little summaries of the breakout groups, but I think it's may be preferable just to uh, have people raise questions or make comments they would like to, uh, to include in the discussion at this point. So let me just open it up to the group. Yeah, Blaine, do you want me to summarize? At, do you want us to summarize at all of the discussion that took place in the, in the small groups or, or not? Uh, we could do that if you'd like. Uh, maybe if we can keep the two minutes for each group so it's real quick. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, in my case, it's, it's really quick. I mean, we touched upon a, a number of really, really interesting topics. I mean, we talked about the, the need for measurements and we talked about the, the philosophical purists who don't think really measurement has a place at all in, in character and virtue theory and why, why we in the Jubilee Center think that things have to be evaluated and measured. And I sort of gave a kind of a pragmatic response to that saying that it would be very difficult for us to go to a school and say that we want to improve the character of your pupils, but actually there is no way that we can prove that or show you any evidence that we have been successful. So just from a pragmatic point of view, I think, I mean, it would be sort of disingenuous of us to, to claim that we have, got, we have got some programs or interventions or, or strategies in place, and, but at the same time say, well, actually the only, you just have to take us on trust because this is Aristotelian and that it must be good. I think that would be disingenuous. Secondly, we talked about uh, whether we are in the Jubilee Center are mainly doing sort of scientific studies in schools, interventions with pre and post tests. And I sort of emphasize that that's not the case at all. I mean, most of the work we do with schools is much more informal and has to do with what we call character court, namely to look at the culture and the ethos of the school and how that can be improved not through some formal, you know, psychological interventions, but through other, other less in, informal measures. And, and we talked about the role of the head teacher or the principal uh, and the importance of some, having somebody in charge of the school who is who's concerned about the, the overall character message that the school conveys. And, and then finally, we talked about the pros and cons of interdisciplinarity. And while we all agreed that interdisciplinarity is a, is a great concept and, and really valuable and actually invaluable in, in the research that we are conducting. We, we also noted that the journal, the academic journal world is still very conservative and very clearly divided up into silos. So sometimes it's difficult to get interdisciplinary studies I and mean, papers describing inter interdisciplinary studies published in high impact journals because they just want a paper in pure philosophy or a paper in pure psychology. They don't want to sort of uh, collaborative stuff at all. Okay, thank you. Um, Aidan and Andrew, do you have two minutes for us? Um, yeah, I'll have a go <laughs> summarizing in two minutes. Apologies to my breakout room um, fellows uh, for, the, for this crude summary, but I think we looked um, firstly at, um, well, not take them out, out of order. Uh, we, Charlie asked a good question around some of the limitations of using dilemmas. Um, and the difference, uh, the, the gap that exists between um, knowledge and action, particularly in this area, is something that uh, the Jubilee Centre is aware, not just aware of, but we tried to look at. Uh, Christian published a report last year um, which looked at components of virtue, uh, components of phrenesis, which attempted to address some of the, the gap between knowledge and action. Um, we also talked about um, some of the tensions between a neo Aristotelian conception of virtue, conception of character, um, and then a more McIntyrean application um, within professional practice. Um, how some of our work, in particular methodology, has gone about trying to adapt to that. And whilst we've applied in the centre the same uh, methodology across now six of the professions, the seventh one, the British Army, was, was done slightly differently, although it followed a fairly similar um, uh, method. 
it is something that we're we aren't aware of um again and it's something that we try to play out a lot more um in the interviews and the qualitative data collection that we've um that we've gone about so actually using dilemmas um even constructing them using an expert panel um and trying to get them to be as realistic or as representative of a, of a particular professional example of virtues in conflict as we can they don't always play out like that even just the the action of reading them online um, in a survey and then being given a choice of uh, option a or option b um, in terms of an action can be quite limiting uh, it's much more than it's less about the option in terms of the action it's much more about the reasoning that sits behind um, that action choice that we're interested in particularly then when we can uh, delve into that a bit more um, with interviews and understand a bit more about is it is this somebody is this a professional that just follows the rules because they're the rules or actually is it how does the application of uh, virtue um, actually come about okay thank you for that uh, Franco do you have a quick summary for us Yes, I'm going to try and be quick because we talked a lot about, about a lot of very interesting things. So first of all, we talked about self-reflection, self-wisdom, self-reflection as kind of being really the most distinct aspect of the framework in as much as you really kind of um, invites researchers to place more emphasis on the intersection of kind of metacognition and affect and the fact that particularly in the digital age, arguably, you know, the, the internet really makes it um, more, more, you know, makes it paramount to really navigate emotions uh, and perspectives because as I was saying earlier, you know, the affordances in the particular economy of the internet really kind of, uh, you know, kind of reinforce um, issues and risks that, that really have to do with, with, with affect and emotions. Uh, we also talked about um, kind of the tension between kind of phrenesis and therefore said the wisdom as, as a concept that kind of draws on, on phrenesis that is somehow at the intersection of also kind of um, universality in terms of kind of prescribing what it should entail in terms of certain components that you should expect, you know, every user to have. But then also the problem of, to some extent, the strength, but also the problem of phrenesis being very contextually sensitive, which means that it's great, every, you know, everything varies depending on the particular context in which you're in. But then at the end of the day, this also raises some, some challenges in terms of ob obviously measuring and, and, and kind of researching, you know, wisdom. Um, then um, Pamela said something really important about the concept of kind of extended cognition, because we were talking about how important it is to kind of go beyond looking at wisdom as something that just belongs to the individual, right? And we were, you know, we were talking about the importance of somehow also bridging, you know, wisdom from a micro from a micro perspective which is you know you know the, the wisdom of users and what they should be doing when they're using digital technologies with kind of wisdom as a macro concept that has to do with how the digital environment internet corporations and platforms are designed and regulated and managed in the first place and that's why there's a lot of research now that is really blossoming in terms of how you know our expectations are re as researchers and as a society in terms of how these platforms should, should be designed in line in line with certain virtues and you know in ways that are ethically sound and then we also talked about the importance of kind of uh, kind of community and so um, something very important is that you know we, it would be really good to somehow also expect users and young people particularly to you know to to be able to transfer uh, their kind of metacognition and cognitive skills from the online context into kind of the, the, the offline context because we were saying that there's a lot that children and young people can learn in terms of how they interact uh, uh, you know with one another within you know context kind of kind of kind of online communities and so on in which obviously again Again, those are probably very much underpinned by the sense of identity and motivation and this is idea of belonging to kind of being part of a kind of an imagined community, if you will, and then transferring all of those skills and kind of motivation and, and blueprint vision uh, into kind of also offline kind of context. Okay, thank you. These are very intriguing conversations. So um, what questions do you still have for the presenters that they haven't responded to yet? Would you like to talk about for the next few minutes? Everyone, go ahead. Um, so telos and purpose is something that I'm very interested in. And so just a very practical question um, that either Aiden or Andrew, you said you didn't have time to explain was how you operationalized or conceptualized professional purpose in the police study. And I'm so I'm curious how the Jubilee Center both thinks about measuring purpose uh, practically in a profession, so like maybe a little p-purpose and how that relates to virtue formation, and then also the role of telos 
or a greater capital P purpose in the general blueprint that the center that Christian um, uses. So I'm not sure if those are related. From my perception, they are, but I might be misreading them. Curious. Yeah, so just to begin with uh, the more abstract concept or sort of uh, a general purpose. So we sort of, in a way, operationalize that, although I know Lynn doesn't like that term, in terms of moral identity. So we sort of connected the, 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 the general moral purpose uh, notion in Aristotle with, with sort of attempts in contemporary moral psychology to look at a person's moral identity, which is sort of general, the general moral outlook. What kind of a person do you really want to be? Do you want to be a, a sort of a, a person who cultivates virtues or, or, or thinks more about self-interest? So that is the sort of the general concept we use in the, in the big phronesis study. Uh, with the professional ethics uh, studies, we have not used that sort of general concept of, of purpose. We've rather been looking at purpose as a professional. So what is your, what is your purpose as being, in being a nurse or being a police officer or, or being a, a doctor of medicine and how, and then we ask a number of different questions about to what extent, you know, uh, collaborating with your colleagues, getting or not getting support from your superiors, various workplace conditions, how these sort of enable you or hinder you in fulfilling your personal purpose as a professional. Uh, so they, these are much more specific questions that we ask, uh, and then we collate those, the, the responses to those questions into a sort of a general purpose in the profession score. Uh, and then we use that score to, to sort of uh, look at associations to various other things like reasoning strategies. And, and we found out a huge difference actually in professions in the UK regarding uh, professional purpose. So for example, although teachers tend to complain a lot about, you know, they, 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 they complain a lot about, you know, all kinds of things, workplace conditions and, and the loss of sense of, of vision and, and purpose, but they still score quite high when we collate all these answers to, you know, workplace conditions and their ability to be the person they want to be in the classroom they still score relatively quite high on, on purpose as a profession in the UK, whereas there are other professions like, like nurses and, and, and lawyers which score quite low. And just this morning, I mean, I saw the first uh, analysis of the data from our police survey and it, to my, somewhat to my surprise, I mean, the, the, the police scored very low on, on professional purpose, uh, much lower than I would have expected. I would have been like, expecting them to be sort of up there with the, with the teachers uh, and maybe the medics, but they seem to be down there with the nurses and the, and the lawyers. And that may have something to do with the fact that obviously the survey was administered during a very, very difficult time for the police in, in the UK and, and elsewhere in the Western world. I mean, with, with all these sort of COVID uh, issues and Black Lives Matter and so on. But there seems to be either there is a big dip or, or in, in professional purpose in policing in the UK or, or there is simply a lack of sense of purpose in general. So, yeah, so, so this was a, a long answer to a simple question, but, but we are looking at it, I mean, I, from, from different perspectives. The, in the phronesis, in the general phronesis work, we are looking at it more in a, from an Aristotelian point of view, as sort of tell us, the, the human tell us what is your, your purpose as a human being in the world. Whereas in the professional protest, we are looking at the at more specifically as professional purpose. You, you as a police uh, officer or a, or a nurse. Okay, yeah, I, I would say that that's not real, wasn't really a simple question and there can be no simple answer to it. So I appreciate your uh, expanding on it. And I, I like this idea of levels of purpose and thinking about it uh, all the way from maybe purpose as a human being to purpose as an individual person, and then everything in between, there's, that, that could be really interesting to look into. Um, Anne, I see you have your uh, hand up. Yes, thanks so much, and thanks to all the presenters. Um, my question, so I, I come from philosophy, and in, on the philosophy side of things, you know, there, there's a um, way of thinking about virtue ethics, uh, where 
what the virtuous person is aiming at is not to be a certain sort of person. That's just like an upshot of the thing she is aiming at, right? What's self-consciously like part of her goal. So we call this like the self-effacingness of whatever ethical theory it is. Um, and other ethical theories might also be self-effacing. And it seems like this is important for measurement um, in a couple of uh, things that you all have talked about. So in, in measuring people's moral reasoning and motivation, you might think that someone is in fact motivated by Kantian reasons, but won't cite explicitly rules <laughs> as the thing that justifies them. Um, they are motivated by duty, but instead what they're thinking about is like, is this the sort of thing which all other reasonable people could accept or wouldn't reject, right? Um, and the justification ultimately is that, you know, the action conforms to a certain rule of this form, um, but maybe the Kantian agent doesn't have the conformity to the rule in mind uh, when she's making a decision, right? Um, similarly, you might think a virtuous agent is not thinking about being empathetic, but rather about the needs of others, like Bernard Williams has this sort of way of talking about virtue ethics. Um, and so I wonder if that affects the way we measure things like motivation, but also things like purpose. Like, do you say explicitly, I want to be a certain sort of person? Or do you ask, like, what's most valuable to you? <laughs> um, and might it not be something like being a certain sort of person, but like, that my community flourish? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree completely. And I think it's, it's one of the sort of negative upshots of undergraduate textbooks in moral philosophy that they tend to depict this sort of three categories of people who don't agree on anything, you know, there are the virtue ethicists and the deontologists and the, you know, consequentialists, and they've got radically different views on, on everything from A to Z in the, in the field of morality. But then actually, when you look at it in practice, that you give them a, a sort of a standard moral quandary, then in 99% of cases, they will agree on actually what is the best course of action. Although they might agree for slightly different reasons. Uh, uh, what it is. So, so this is why we have been sort of trying to avoid simple sort of self-report questionnaires as much as possible. And, and we find that these complex issues that you were referring to, they come out much better in, in semi-structured interviews with people when they describe their life trajectories than they do in, in responses to sort of standard uh, psychological questioning in, in surveys. This is why we, in all the professional uh, projects, we have placed a lot of emphasis on, uh, on that. And, and simply just, in some cases, it's just enough to ask a person, so why did you de decide to become a police officer or a nurse or a, or a, or a lawyer? And we don't really need to add, ask any further question because, I mean, it, this, this person has got so much to say that they can just ramble on for half an hour or an hour about you know, what, what it is that, that drove them towards this. And, and it's, it's really encouraging to see that with many of these professions, actually, there is a very strong moral mission uh, uh, underlying this choice. Uh, and that, that, op that often comes through, like you say, much better in, in sort of deep interviews than in, in, in responding to questions which, by their very nature, are, are going to give us very simplistic uh, answers. I would particularly like to recommend you know, William Damon's book, The Path to Purpose, uh, because I mean, it's a, it's a very nice combination of both sort of survey questions, but also deep interviews with young people. And I think he, he manages in this book to put his finger on many things which are wrong about contemporary education and, and the lack of engagement uh, that many students feel with with their, with their school work or, or college work. And, and uh, I, I love the way he approaches the topic in general. It's unfortunately a book which is not much read or, or cited even in, in, in social science, but I think both for philosophers and who are interested in, in purpose and also for social scientists, this, this is a kind of a standard study of, of, of purpose in, in real life and what it means you know, to have a purpose or not to have a purpose. And he also makes a very interesting uh, and very philosophically nuanced distinction between purpose and meaning, uh, which is also you know, music to the ears of philosophers. Yeah, thank you for that. This, uh, the question of measurement and how to study things is so challenging for all of us, and there are always trade-offs and 
trying to figure out which things you really are after is uh, probably a key uh, point of reference. Um, Kate, you put your hand up too. Yeah, I just wanted to, to add a thought and it, it's sort of something I've been thinking about, but that my thoughts on it are really incohate at this point, but I've worked uh, Uh oh. Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone's frozen. Can anyone hear me? Expertise in virtue could actually be that professional who is giving their judgment with respect to. Uh, an interview response. I think that happens quite naturally anyway, but this is just a way to structure it um, so that you get a bit of continuity across individuals. Elaine, I think Aiden has been raising his hand for a long time. Yes, um, let me apologize for uh, getting lost there for a second. Uh, fortunately, I have co-hosts, so you all were able to stay together while I went away. <laughs> so I'm glad to be back. Um, Aiden, what, uh, maybe you can give us uh, a comment. I think we're getting to the close. We don't have to stop, but people often need to stop at the end. Uh, what, what were your thoughts? Yeah, I was um, going to pick up on something that Christian said. And thank you, Christian, for answering both of those uh, previous questions. Um, where we've looked at purpose in the center and somewhere between the kind of more conceptual notion of, of purpose more broadly and then professional being more purposeful within your profession. Um, we took this outside of uh, professions and back to education in a project we did back in 2017, which looked at um, notions of character and virtue um, with young people on the margins of mainstream education or formerly outside of mainstream education. And we used Bill Damon's uh, conception, Bill Damon and colleagues conception of purpose. Um, quite, it was very much at the heart of what we did. What we found, and this was through uh, quite a large scale survey, but also with the qualitative follow up with young people who were in some cases um, on particularly uh, very different paths, but also potentially quite dangerous paths to use some of their own language there around purpose is that where we gave people, uh, gave young people the language of purpose to use, they were finding purpose in what they were doing. Um, so it might not necessarily have been a language that came uh, obviously to them and maybe we had to define some terms for them to use but actually young people on the margins of education were indicating that they were doing things purposefully not necessarily finding a purpose but doing things purposefully more so than those people in mainstream um, education which we saw as quite a positive um, finding and that nuance was uh, important to us but also, uh, also in this professional work of kind of uh, what are the enablers or barriers to doing things purposefully uh, as a police officer or a nurse or a doctor or, or whatever it might be. As Christian spoke to, we've just got some very, very new findings as of uh, last night and this morning with the police um, data. Um, and it is looking like across the piece that uh, police officers are maybe less purposeful than we might have hoped they might be. And nowhere near as purposeful as teachers or nurses uh, in comparison to the rest of our cohort data. Mm -hmm. So, so let me th see if I can understand what you're saying, Aiden. This sounds really fascinating. Pardon me for um, taking my privilege here, but um, the, um, are you saying that people were saying that the, the, their actions embody purposes? Is that the purposefully as opposed to having a purpose that I then employ actions to achieve? Is that the distinction you're making there? Yeah, I think so. Um, that actually people are doing things for good reasons of maybe uh, purpose can be applied negatively as well but in the, the context of the, the data that we've collected we're talking about it in a positive sense that things are doing things purposefully and that they are intending for it to have a positive outcome um, rather than having this kind of more broad notion of well this is my purpose and this is why i do things because it fulfills my purpose mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. doing things purposefully um without it having that kind of wider fulfillment i think is what i'm trying mm -hmm. to say very interesting. Yeah, quite a nuance. Well, thank you all very much for your participation and your engagement. This has been uh, a very fun day. Um, and uh, thank you folks from the Jubilee Center for kicking off our uh, first conference uh, for the NRM. 
And uh, we'll, we have, as you know, sessions coming up for the next three weeks as well. Um, and I'll continue to send out notices about that and encourage you to register and attend. Um, but this has been a great start. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Blaine, for organizing. Thank you. 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 Thank you.